And um, our guest, as you know, is Eric Schmidt. Eric was a, uh, uh, has an engineering master's degree and computer science degree from Berkeley. He was the CEO of uh, Novell for a while. Before that, uh, chief of software for uh, Sun Microsystems. Uh, did distributed software design as a, for his doctoral dissertation at Berkeley, uh, and then was uh, recruited by Larry Page and Sergey Brin, Sergey Brin to uh, be the CEO of Google. Last year, he became the executive chairman of Google. He's also had the great distinction of working at the two greatest research labs of the old days, which is Xerox Park and Bell Labs. And uh, he is somebody who is both understands the future and his book, The New Digital Age, written with Jared Cohn, some of you were in this room a month ago when we did an interview with Jared, uh, talked about both the values and the relationship between the virtual world and the real world that we're going to face in the new digital age. It's for sale out there. You'll be so inspired by this talk, you'll want to buy it. Uh, but let's start, if I may, Eric, on a broader topic which is coming out of this recession, mature economies, Europe and the United States, have not done all that well. What can we do to kickstart that? Well, first, thank you very much for having me back. It's, it's always great to be back in Aspen. And um, Walter hosted a, a book event in Washington uh, with the Aspen Institute that I think if you go back and look at during our book tour, was probably the highest quality in terms of conversation and so forth. So it's a pleasure thank to be you. back. And I actually mean Thanks that. Thanks a I'm lot. I'm not just making Appreciate that up. Yeah. As I usually just make stuff up. In Washington, uh, so. in Washington, we always say insincere flattery is better than sincere flattery, though, because it shows you're worth lying about. So I don't care. <laughs> I don't care whether it was sincere or not. <laughs> that was actually sincere. I'll come okay. up with some insincere flattery, Feel like free. you handsome devil, you. Yes, right. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, so on, on that note. Um, <laughs> I'm, it's pretty clear that the emerging markets are going to do fine for a while because they have demographic benefits. Everybody's moving to the middle class. We all understand that pretty well. Uh, but we seem to be in a state where these large, mature democracies, uh, I'm thinking Europe, uh, the United States, Japan, a few others, uh, they're having growth problems. Um, the numbers roughly America, with all of our entrepreneurial spirit, can manage to grow at 2% a year. The math is such that if we could grow at 3 or 4% a year, it would be phenomenally better in our country. Um, in Europe, of course, they're now entering their third self-induced recession for reasons that are unclear to Americans, but make perfect sense to Europeans. And they're effectively in a low growth, no growth situation for a pretty long time, maybe, maybe five years or longer. So what causes growth? Well, one way to think about this is that we've transitioned in 100 years from a farming and resource economy to a knowledge economy. So once you, and by the way, the Aspen Institute represents the knowledge economy, so that we all are, are, believe in the church of knowledge economy. What does it take to be successful? Well, jobs are created in the private sector. Employment and wealth is created in the private sector, not by the government, sorry. Um, and it's done by entrepreneurs and innovation, which we can talk about. Um, but there's some, th some things that society needs to do. One obvious thing is immigration. There's been this big debate about immigration. America is sufficiently stupid that we take smart people from other countries, we educate them at the best universities of the world, and we kick them out to send them to other countries to create companies that compete with mine. Yeah, yeah you agree, it's a great strategy. Excellent strategy. Perfect American political outcome. Anyway, I, won't, I can go on about that for a while, but that one is so obvious. Right? What about the status of women? Right? Women are still underemployed in many cases, creating the necessary environments for women entrepreneurs, women uh, leadership, and so forth. This new generation of women that are fantastic, we need lots more of them, right, for all the reasons that everybody knows here. What about connectivity? About 2.3 billion people are connected to the internet. That's, a, that's not a majority of humans. Mm -hmm. It's a minority of, of humans, right? And then what about entrepreneurship? What about the capital and so forth? You have to come up with some set of solutions to make that. And what I, what I find when we have these conversations and we look at the media and the press coverage, everybody misses this. Somehow they think that we're going to solve this problem by changing this government policy. But what we need to do is come up with policies which actually allow the creative people who can create value, invent new things, so forth. In the next decades, right, we have huge ideas on the, on the table, right? 
that could really materially affect this. They provide huge new jobs, right? Huge new choices of employment. That's what we should be focusing on. Give, give me some examples of the next 10 years, the huge new things on the horizon. Well, medicine is the most obvious one. Um, the, the mobile phones, which everybody carries, um, are essentially mobile diagnostic devices in the next generation. You put little plugs in them that can receive things, and then your body can, using various techniques, rings, such as the various fit rings that exist today, uh, more significant things, pills that you ingest that Wi-Fi out the conditions of your stomach, all of these things, that, by the way, you'll take it if you need it. That's right. Don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> nanomaterials that bind to specific proteins in special ways to detect uh, cancer. Uh, you know, examples of this are all in the labs, right? So all of a sudden what will happen is instead of you calling the doctor, the phone will call the doctor, and the doctor will call you back after the phone talks to the doctor. <laughs> but let, let me right. say, ask and, a, some, As an example, but let's think about right. transportation. All right. right. Let's think about transportation. Let's rethink transportation, right? 31,000 people are dying on American highways every year. Now, that may seem like a small number, but imagine if you meet somebody who's lost somebody in a highway accident. That's 100% tragedy for that family. That's, by the way, the lowest number on a deaths per mile basis, so we're proud of that. It's 31,000 people, that's horrific, right? It's horrific. And we now are just at the point where cars can be automated enough that many of the configurations, especially when you're drunk, <laughs> can save you. There's examples of rethinking using the airspace more. There's on and on and on uh, that are coming. And we're, we're not fully embracing them as a society, and they're certainly not being embraced in other places like in Europe and Japan. Well, you painted this great picture of medical uh, technology, and yet most people in this room probably don't even have electronic medical records. Why is that so hard to do things now? Uh, because, electronic, because electronic medical records require the government to participate, right? And government, our government is designed to move slowly, right? You're a historian, you understand this very well. Um, it's not supposed to react to this kind of stuff, but the private sector will get this stuff fixed if the incentives mm -hmm. are right. Mm -hmm. It's extraordinary, I think, again, people here may or may not like fracking, but the fact of the matter is that fracking technology has changed the entire energy equation for, the, for America, right? And by the way, it was invented in America by small companies and entrepreneurs that figured out a new way to do this horizontal drilling, right, in very clever ways, and then all the big companies busy bought them, mm -hmm. right? That cycle is true in businesses other than my own. What about uh, uh, education technology? Well, you're of course working in this area as well. I think a number of people in the room that I know are working in this as well. Um, the educational establishment is largely structured as a monopoly. Right? Think about, you know, as a parent, you have a kid, the kid has to go to the local school, the local school is run by the government. Um, there's a series of, in, of initiatives over the last 20, 20 years, including charter schools, school choice, and so forth and so on, to try to get those monopolies to be more restrictive. But the teachers are still in a situation where they're not ranked for their own performance, which makes no sense to me, mm -hmm. right? If you care about your kid, you should try to figure out if the teachers are good or not. It's like, what's wrong with this argument? So given that the sort of the rate of change in education is so slow, perhaps the best way to approach this is, is online. And parents want their kids to, to learn. You're gonna be honoring here later this summer, Saul Khan, who's a true hero. And if you're not familiar with Saul's story, the, the 10 second summary is that he started tutoring a cousin using YouTube videos of eight minutes long. He's a gifted teacher. And they're now working on a program, which again, you'll hear more about it if you come to your event in August, where what they're trying to do is they're trying to invert the classroom. And the thesis is that students at home watch videos, do various things, and then when they get in the classroom, they engage in collaborative learning. And the early evidence of this is that it's statistically significant gains, mostly in math so far, because they can measure that. And the ones that they get the biggest gains in are the remedial students. Because the way it works, let's use math as an example. You've got uh, a series of building blocks. And so you're an underprivileged kid who's having trouble and you're distracted or your family's a mess or what have you. You show up at school, you miss this building block. Well, when you miss that building block, you miss the entire rest of the year because you need that building block to understand it. And then you get labeled as poor, dumb, disaffected, you act out, what have you. Uh, it looks like self-learning, properly managed, can allow that student to catch up. And we now have some evidence that in that situation, especially for remedial students, they can actually come back better than the traditional students if they have the time to do it. I'm not, uh, there, we need hundreds of examples. You're working on a couple of other ones. 
Um, we need hundreds of examples that try to break the current monopoly rear ends and seats kind of uh, teaching model. People mm -hmm. learn in all sorts of different ways. Uh, we have uh, Charlie Firestone's you know, Media and Communication sure. Society group here talking about e-commerce. What do you see in the next four or five years as the next breakthrough of e-commerce? or? digital coins or some way of having well, it's, less it's, it's friction a, as you go through and buy things on the internet? Well, in, for the last 30 years, people have been working on what are known as microtransactions. Um, the Bitcoin technology, independent of whether you believe it should be illegal or legal, uh, and most governments have decided that it's illegal for a whole bunch of reasons uh, involving they want to see what's going on. Uh, Bitcoin as a, as a technical achievement uh, is impressive because they created something which was digital and had artificial scarcity, which is hard to do. In the digital world, mostly copies are free, and they figured out a way to make it hard to make copies of these things, right. Right, which is sort of the technical achievement of it. Um, my own feeling about electronic commerce is that the big thing that will happen is when on your mobile phone, you'll be driving down the street, and the phone, and, the, and you've all opted in, and, and this is what you want, and it says, Eric, you need new jeans, okay? There's a <laughs> jean store on the left, which has 15% off, and there's a gene score on the right that has 20% off, and the one on the 15% has better parking. Okay, that's what you want the transaction to be. I'm serious. So you you get in your so you, your your phone says this, you turn left, you park, you walk in, and the store clerk hands you the pants sized for you. Right? And says hello by name, the way they do of course. when you come and in. And they think yeah. you're having a personal relationship. Yeah. Of course. <laughs> it's called marketing. That's right. But, but technically, that's uh, relatively easily achievable if you take the combination of everything. Uh, we already have situations where supermarkets and other stores are using inside the store, um, trying to give you offers as you walk down the aisle, because right? they can roughly pinpoint your location using the Wi-Fi signals that you're using. So this is coming. Right? Is this an incentive to give up some of your privacy or anonymity? That's a very complicated question. Sorry. So one, um, <laughs> some people will right. and some people won't. And Google will help us uh, calibrate that we want to turn on and off so that we have control? The general answer on these things is privacy um, you want to tell people what you're doing, mm -hmm. and you want to believe that they're informed enough to make a decision. Um, I have a lot of, of comfort and belief in the people who believe in empowerment of individuals and making these choices. I'm somewhat more critical of the people who want to make that choice one way or the other for me. Right. Right. You know, Google is all about individual empowerment. You, you, you're educated. You, under, you, you understand the choice. There's issues of what you do with teenagers and kids, which is a separate issue. Which, which is real, right. but for adults, let's let adults try to make these choices. You know, you talk about the virtual world, the real world, the relationship in your book. One of the differences is in the real world, the physical world, whether it's us in Aspen or, Wa or Washington DC wandering around, you don't have pure anonymity. There's always a chance people know who you are, they know you by face. Whereas you can be purely anonymous now on the internet. Is that a generally good thing or bad thing? Well, historically, pure anonymity has not existed. If you go back to small towns and villages 100 years ago, everybody knew you and your business, and you could imagine the rumor mill if you made a mistake or did a crime or, or something like that. So it's not like we lived in this sort of uh, wonderful past world of no one knowing what we were, what we were doing. Um, so the technolo let's talk about what the technology does and then try to figure out what the right answer is. The technology naturally collects information because it has to. Everyone here has a mobile phone, mm -hmm. right? Does everyone aware that your telco knows exactly where you are? Mm -hmm. Do you know why? 911 services. By law, E911 services have to know exactly where you are. We accept that because that information, by the way, is kept in the telcos and is stored you know, and it's only available under some very unique situations. So that's an example of that trade-off. Um, in our case, with Android phones, we actually only will transmit information about where you are with your opt-in and only with a delay and, and so forth. So we put limitations on that as well. But the technology naturally collects this data to do its job. It does not then follow 
that it should be saved, stored, given to the police, given to the government, and so forth. That's a societal decision. So let's figure out how to draw that line, because okay. we have been talking about it this week. Google, let us say, Google and its phones or whatever, might know who I've been phoning, where I've been, well, of course the phone emails, who, the and phone the phone company knows who yeah. you call. Right, American right. Express knows all a, these and there's, things. And there's a, there's a law, called it's called CALEA, which actually allows the tel telcos to wiretap your phones and give all that information, and it's now applied to texting as well. To the government. To the, to when the, the, US gov to the U.S. government. Right. And so what happens when the U.S. government, as has happened, and you all have posted on it on Google, uh, says we need this type of information, either through the courts or through a FISA court? How do you all make that decision? Well, ultimately, the government has nuclear weapons, and we don't. <laughs> So there's, there's sort of a power imbalance. Everybody yes. with the program there here? There was a wonderful Earl Long line down in Louisiana when uh, Leander Perez was trying to resist the feds. He says, the feds have got the nukes now. What are you going to do mm. now, Leander? We don't, so you end up we don't have up. any nukes. We're not planning on having nukes. Yeah. That's not a proposal for nukes. Okay. okay, I hope I'm clear. That was a joke, <laughs> right? In the age of Twitter, you actually have to label your jokes, okay? So no one is confused about that, okay? Uh, so, so the way the law works is that there, uh, let's excuse FISA for a sec, uh, a legitimate court can send you a record if you're a telco and can say, we want uh, a phone record or a, what they call a trap. Mm -hmm. um, they, there is a similar procedure for email, and it's one-to-one. -one, and it requires a, a federal judge, I believe, to say this is what it is. And we publish the number of such things. You would be shocked to discover the number of criminals who use email to plot their crimes, mm -hmm. right? So it's not a good idea if you're a criminal to use things which are so, so recorded, I guess, right? Uh, and so this has been true for a very long time. Many people are also confused because they think that they, their email is their own when it's given to them by a company. So it's also important to know that in, under American law, your company, if you're using corporate resources, owns your email including any private email that may be used going through their servers. And because email is naturally stored and forward, there's a copy stored. Peer-to-peer -peer stuff, which is more complicated, like I can explain in a sec, does not have these properties. It has a different set of rules. So the current kerfuffle is over something called a FISA court, which were created under the Patriot Act and strengthened under Patriot II. Um, and what a FISA court, Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, uh, creates a separate secret set of judges who can give orders that are analogous to the ones I got, but the recipients are not allowed to, um, to document or to announce that they got them. So Google has, over time, been subject to a few of these, uh, but we're not allowed to say how many and, and so forth. So we recently, in fact, filed a lawsuit or in the process of filing a lawsuit with the FISA court to ask them to let us say how much they have done. What type of things could they get and might they want to get? Um, we're, we're getting into an area where I, I'm not a, a legal expert, so uh, the summary would be that um, a typical thing that they, that I, if, if I were on the FISA court, I would want emails. Because mm -hmm. again, people, people tend to plot. Including people. the text of the email they can get. Well, presumably that's why they're reading the email. Right. So let us say that somebody's... Uh, and, and I should say that, that uh, Verizon, in the, in the latest, in the PRISM stuff, was subject uh, and has been well documented to a very broad order which they did comply to. Right, but let us say that somebody's texting, making phone calls to a known cell phone terrorist in Pakistan. Would you stop doing that? <laughs> Me, personally? Yes, known terrorist in <laughs> Pakistan. Should... Uh, Give the phone number to say. Uh, and emailing uh, or whatever. Do we want to draw the line so the government can say, let's track that person? It's. That's a decision not for Google or me or right. you. It's a decision for society. Mm -hmm. In the American system, the NSA law basically says this applies when people in the US are talking to non-US people not in the US. That's a rough summary. Mm -hmm. The Fourth Amendment protects our activities within the United States. Mm -hmm. And um, from the standpoint of what the technology can do, the technology can do a great deal more. There have been, over a few decades, proposals by various groups of the government to do, there was one called Total Information Awareness, if you can imagine right. a worse name. Oliver North, right. Yeah. Um, and the idea there is basically to take all of the digital information that's assembled that on wherever people are, what they're doing, and so forth, 
and use that for essentially signals intelligence. That, those have been largely shut down for uh, first, sorry, Fourth Amendment reasons or privacy reasons. So from a technological perspective, you can do, and again, I'm not endorsing this so we're clear, you can take all of this data, and there are rumors, I don't know this, I'm not cleared for it, there are rumors that such data has been collected, um, to use it to do data mining. And data mining rough, roughly looks like this. We take everybody in the room, and we look at, and we get some important fact about you, and we put it all in a database, and we see what's common, okay? And it's all pretty boring stuff. And then we say, well, what's uncommon? So one of you turns out to spend an awful lot of time talking to Pakistan. Hmm. So maybe you have a relative in Pakistan or not. So that would be an example of how, how you would use data mining to make an alert. Does that the, the, personally the, 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 offend you, your uh, values? Leave aside speaking for Google. Yeah, I mean, wanna, uh, well, let me just explain yeah. what is possible here. So from my perspective, well, again, so if you, if you extend that idea for a while, think about it as we can find people who are doing things which are not using this technology. We could, if we wanted to, identify these, these out of bound experiences. So then it's really a societal question of where the balance of police state versus individual freedom is. Um, and that's something which we're gonna be debating for a very long time. I'll give you the most extreme case. How, do you, how would you feel if the government became a police state in such a way that we, that, not we, the government, could figure out all the things that you were doing. Well, you'd say it would probably be better to catch child molesters, because that's a really bad thing, but it would also mean that people who make what many of us would view as minor infractions, so if you're a liberal, you think marijuana smoking is fine. Um, in California, there's this bizarre property where illegal aliens can get driver's licenses, <laughs> right? And that's a political compromise, which exists for, for many, many reasons, and I think mostly good. Um, do you really want the government in there at that level of detail in private behavior? And in America, the general answer has been no. Mm -hmm. right? and, and I think for the right reasons. Furthermore, we have a history in our country with J. Edgar Hoover and Watergate of occasional government overstep, which is not, not in dispute. So the, to me, the question as a society is where do you draw that line? I personally believe that there are cases where some of this surveillance can be helpful to prevent terrorism. And I'd much rather prevent terrorism than spend a trillion dollars invading Iraq. Okay, it's much cheaper to prevent mm -hmm. the terrorist than to invade the country, mm -hmm. right? It's not a complicated argument. Right. But drawing that criteria turns out to be extremely difficult. Right. And I think it's going to be a, this group process in our country for a very, very long time. We trust Verizon to have all that data, or American Express to know everything I've bought, or Google to know all my email. But do you think it's important to draw a line saying government shouldn't know as much as Google or Verizon? No, I'm not, I'm not making any of those claims. Yeah. Right. What I'm saying is that it's a democracy. It's, it's, it's the best, democracy is the best, mani best maneuver we've come up with. Uh, America is a strong and principled place around individual freedom. We have to find the balance here. Um, in the PRISM case, what happened, w w Google was particularly upset because one of the slides said that the NSA had a direct connection into Google, which is completely false. We've spent a month explaining that one, this is not true, it wasn't true, it will not be true, any such activity would be illegal. Um, and so one simple answer, when, I, when we're asked about this, we say, look, if the government is behaving legally, then this is not the case. Mm -hmm. And we want a legal government. So. Uh, let's move on to Google Glass, which is kind of a cool thing. Will that change our social etiquette in ways where uh, we certainly will have less anonymity if people are wandering around able to photograph us, maybe do facial recognition? The, the t let me describe the technology so everybody understands. Think of a uh, the equivalent of something with the power of a personal computer, which has a forward-facing camera and a camera that is this little glass thing that you can see, which is phenomenal technology. It's an amazing breakthrough. It's like a, it's like a big monitor, but it's right there at your eye, and you can focus on it at any level, so it's very, very clear. Uh, it can speak to you using um, uh, induction, so it uses a little, it talks to you basically through the back of your ear, and you talk to it, and you say, okay, glass, and you give it a question, and it gives you an answer. 
it just blows you away. And I think for me, with my uh, version of Glass, um, the most surprising thing for me was the fact that I could talk to it and it could talk back as reliably. And that's one of the great breakthroughs in the last five years is the ability to do, even in crowded situations, right, with a lot of background and so forth, you can talk to this. A lot of people believe that the next computer interface is actually going to be speech-based because of this and other, and other things. So we've released now some number of thousands of these into the, into the wild, right, into ex what we call explorers who are doing beta testing. And whenever you see somebody with them, they're always sort of showing it off and people are playing with it and so forth. We're trying to figure out where that limit is. Uh, unlike our other products, where we normally just throw them over the wall in the apps and so forth, we're being extremely careful about what apps can be downloaded on top of, the, uh, on top of this. And we've also said publicly, and I'll repeat here, that we're not going to allow essentially the face recognition side of it to happen. Um, many people have suggested, wouldn't it be great when I walk into a party and I, I saw people and I could see the names of everybody? <laughs> okay, well, uh, especially if you don't really remember very well, this is like a great feature. The problem is that the level of abuse of that is, is very high, P potential abuse is very high. It's clearly over the line in our view. Um, what other things have you decided are over the line? We're still testing, but I think that's, that, that's, uh, that's the first one. There clearly will be an emerging social etiquette around wearable technology. In other words, um, uh, do you think it would be over the line if, I, if you could video or photograph somebody without them knowing? Because at the moment, I think it was a tiny red light. That's yeah, again, part of, part of what we're experimenting with is how do you make sure somebody else knows that there is some form of, uh, and it makes sense, right? If you're running around with a big camera on your chest, I'm going to presume that it's on, right? So what's the analogous thing for this new technology? Now, now um, a lot of people believe that, the, um, that this kind of technology, the deconstruction of computing, will become quite pervasive and that we'll be wearing the equivalent of sophisticated watches. There's been a lot of rumors about companies doing sophisticated watches, various uh, necklaces and armbands and so forth that are very, very powerful and very useful. But we're going to have to, as a society, agree to what's appropriate, what's not. There are clearly situations where it's not appropriate to be wearing these things. You talked a moment ago about voice recognition and the leaps that have happened in the past five to seven years of just being able to have not only a, a, a machine uh, understand the words, but understand the context. How did that technology develop? Was it ground up, or did you? Um, in, in Google's case, uh, and I think we're the, the world leader in this now, pretty well established, um, we did it differently. All the previous attempts had taken the equivalent of dictionaries. And, and you know, with a computer, you can read the dictionary, kind of figure out bigrams or collections of words, intuit meaning, and so forth. We did it completely differently. We took the, the language that we saw on the web and in queries, and we took that, and we learned how to recognize it. So we did it from the, the spoken, essentially the way it was delivered as opposed to the way it was, uh, and we had various people train it in that way. So it started off with recognition and then the speaking part. We're now at the point where, under reasonably flexible conditions, you can get on the phone, speak in English on a phone, and on the other side it comes out in German. So how does that work? Well, the phone hears your voice and turns it into text in English. It sends it to the servers. So technically, it's done in the servers, but you get the idea. It muddles around in the server for a while, translates it into German, turns it back into text in German, and then from text to speech in German, it comes out the other end. Now, it doesn't sound like you in German. Right? We haven't got that right. But, but you can understand it enough that it works. The last great leap in computer interfaces may have come when you were at Xerox Park, and all of a sudden they became graphical and you could just point to a trash can. How will voice recognition change the human-machine interface? Many people believe that the next UI is really AI. In other words, that the, that the, the, the predominant way in which we were taught to use computers which has this static picture, which I participated in and you've profiled for many, many years, it really will change to something which is highly specific to you. It'll, be, it'll change to where am I, what am I doing, and it'll change in a way that's natural. Think of it as much more. And, and the eventual path of computing is to imagine sort of the, the perfect personal digital friend, assistant, helper, right? And again, this is all opt-in, you've chosen this, you know, you've bought, you've signed on contract, you know, I want it to do all these things. 
So it knows where you are, it knows your schedule, it anticipates things that you might like, it makes suggestions to you, it learns from you, and again, you've opted in for this, so don't go crazy on, the, on me on this stuff. Um, it's very, very, very useful. Will you use that? Some of you will. Not all of you, but, but some the of interface you will. will be voice, not um, typing or touching. Many people believe that the interfaces will be voice and then very sophisticated UIs that have not been invented, but they'll be much more task specific. One of the questions that people don't know is we have this huge transition to mobile, and the mobile interfaces don't look like web computing. Mm -hmm. They just don't, right? So if you look at uh, Instagram, Vine, um, sort of the current hot Snapchat, the current hot mobile apps, all of them have very distinct UIs that make sense to the task. Right? They're, very, they're limited UIs that are very task specific. It may very well be that mobility defines that because our fingers don't get any bigger, the screens are not getting bigger, the computers are faster, but, but we're still limited by our, the size of our digital you know, fingers and all that. Uh, this move towards apps and mobile, how does that affect the web and the searchability of the web? Um, so far it's been positive. Um, there's a generic concern that the web will be balkanized. In the book, we talk about countries balkanizing the web. It's also possible that corporations could balkanize the web. So imagine a corporation that became the way AOL was 20 years ago, where they had lots of proprietary information, but you couldn't get to it. You couldn't get to it through search engines. You couldn't link to it. Historically, though, it looks like the power of the open web, the power of your sharing your information is so great the pressure from users to keep the web open will continue. But you can't search easily social network information on my Facebook page, let us say. Well, you can if you use Google+. Right. Are you trying to move everybody off no, of but Google my, but do you applications see what I'm into Google+. Uh, well, Google Plus is one of our strategic initiatives, but you don't have to use Google Plus if you don't want to. But I you're shutting it. down even things like Latitude, iGoogle, no, Google Wave, Plus. and pushing people into Plus. Yeah, but we use Plus for authentication. You don't have to use the Plus services. Uh, one of the secrets when, when you get all these systems working together is you need common login. You need a common way of identity. You need to be, hang things so off. So once of you identity. do that, you're not going to become let us say, like AOL or no, other companies no. that start with an A, like Apple, we, we, in which there's a walled garden? Uh, the answer is no. Do I need to spell it? N. <laughs> N and an O? Yeah. No, not going to happen. Um, go back to uh, what you said, AI, artificial intelligence, that you can chat with your, your computer, natural interface. Will computers also at some point be able to feel emotions? There are, there's a set of research projects which looking at face and listening to your voice have become pretty good at judging your emotions. Uh, no one quite knows how that will turn into an app, but again, if you go back to this fictional, personal digital friend, if you will, uh, so imagine you have a, an Android device that has you know, a nice big screen and it has a face and it has eyes. Um, and it's sort of your companion, right? Um, and this companion does know you pretty well. And let's imagine for purposes of argument that it's pretty good at understanding your emotions through this new technology. It makes sense to me um, that it could really help, right? And you could imagine things like if you're a person who's very depressed, it could actually at some point you get depressed enough, you could say, I'm gonna call the, call, call the, mm -hmm. call the hospital. I mean, th th these are very meaningful tools if they're done right. These are obviously speculation. Uh, in 1950, uh, Alan Turing said that by the year 2000, we would have machines that passed what became called the Turing test, which is you wouldn't be able right. to tell the machine from a human being. Uh, he was wrong. Will he ever be right? Um, he will be. Uh, so the test that Alan proposed, which is known as the Turing test, is that you, you basically have um, a screen, and behind it you have a computer and you have a person and you can ask A or B a question, um, and you're, you have to guess correctly or incorrectly whether it's the computer or the person. Um, many people in AI believe that we're close to that within the next five years. The best example is the Watson, uh, Watson project, basically, which is a very, very sophisticated AI computer that will beat you at jeopardy, trust me. And what you do with, with Watson is you train it with all, you can train it with all this information, and it becomes quite an expert. Many people believe that the way you would trick the computer and, and is that you would f figure out that of the two people you were debating, the one that was smarter was the computer, 
right? So there's but a, the computer is smart enough to trick back and so make So the mistakes. question is, can we limit yeah. the appar in this test? Can we limit the apparent intelligence? Because computers are different from people. Computers have perfect memory. So the so in this case, the computer would but have to forget a few the, things. But you know, the computer in Alan Turing's original paper, when he's doing the question and answer, is given a complex math question and gets it slightly wrong in order to try to convince. So smart enough to yeah. not be too smart. Uh, which most of us don't have that talent. But, 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 but you, we're just using the Turing test as an example to make the point. But let's think about the eventual structure here. So we have humans, that's us. Mm -hmm. What are we really good at? Creativity, emotion, drive, power, culture, all of these things. It'll be a very long time before computers are very good at that. Um, we can debate whether in 100 years computers will be good at it, but certainly not in the next decade. Um, what computers will be very good at some things we're not very good at. Perfect memories, remember where you were, your photographs, keep, keep all of those kinds of things. And also they're very good at needle in a haystack problems. We were talking earlier about the data mining problem, mm -hmm. uh, problem or opportunity depending on your point of view in, um, in security. You can data mine all this information out, and computers can do that. We have to decide as a society. Would there ever to. be a huge fundamental shift if you couldn't tell humans from computers? Well, the, the computer people would say that eventually computers will become, in the areas that computers are good at, smarter than humans. Yeah. So it's not, you'd have to decide to restrict it. And the reason is because computers get faster as a computational power just increases. Now I should say before you get too freaked out about this, that Moore's law is slowing. Mm -hmm. That Moore's law, which was presented roughly 40 years ago, talked about roughly the doubling of transistor density every um, two years. And that doubling has created all of the wealth, all the power, all the reach, and so on. It's an incredibly important law, and thank you for the physicists to make this happen. There's a series of reports, which is part of the book research I actually went through, where people have studied this, and it looks like the fundamental gains that we've seen in the last few decades will be slowing down. Um, that much of the gain in computational performance is occurring through parallelism. Um, and they they're basically putting more computers on a single chip. And so that indicates that there's some limit to the madness of the things we're talking about. Let's uh, come back down from 30,000 feet to more specific things. Uh, Apple, uh, I remember when I was writing about Apple, sure. there was a war going on. How is the relationship with Google and Apple now? Um, it's gotten better. Um, the uh, Tim, well, first place I think is you, you and I are both, we're very good friends of Steve, and it's a terrible loss to, to the world. It's a truly Truly, truly great man. Uh, but Tim has done, I think, a good job of taking over the, com the company. Um, and Apple is a well-run company run under a different set of principles than Google, but that doesn't take away from what they're doing. Um, and we worked hard to work with them on various things. They clearly made a decision on the Maps thing a year ago. But once we put our Maps on their platform, they immediately allowed it to be there and so forth. So we're working on it. Uh, but the Android approach is fundamentally different from yes. the iOS approach. Why do you think the Android approach is better? Um, a little bit of the history, for those of you who haven't followed this. At about the same time um, the iPhone project was invented for iOS, uh, a team led by a guy named Andy Rubin was founded to create um, a, an operating system called Android. Google bought Andy and his team a rough, roughly similar period. Uh, and they became part of what we were doing. And the, the iPhone um, history, which you have documented very thoroughly, um, is basically take the Apple OS, and I was on the board of Apple at the time, so I was part of this, um, and turn it into this incredibly powerful phone, and then in version two, add APIs, add applications, and then have a set of carriers and a set of choices. Um, you cannot, if you're not Apple, um, get a copy of the source code, the hardware is proprietary, and they do a great job. Our approach was completely different. So we said we'll take Linux, which is a generally, generally free version of Unix, and we'll purchase or buy out or build all the pieces that you'd need to have an open sourced phone. That became Android. We announced it in roughly 19, uh, 2008 uh, with a series of phones. And now the number one phone in the world is the Samsung S4, uh, both numerically and I think also in terms of features. And Samsung uses Android for that. Um, there's a set of things that we did that, uh, um, that worked very well. Android is free, so the hardware manufacturers don't pay us anything, and they can do whatever they want to with it. 
However, they, most of them have agreed that they want to be able to run applications through something called the Google App Store, and that's how we've kept compatibility. Over the years, I've done a series of these open source strategies, and they always splintered. And indeed, Apple uh, spent a lot of time criticizing a the Android strategy because they believed it would, splitter, it would split too, but it has not. Uh, and today, if you buy uh, an HTC phone or an Samsung, Samsung phone or a Nexus phone, you can, in fact, run the apps on the same device. Why did Google buy uh, Motorola? Motorola? Uh, two reasons. One is that they had very good patent portfolio, and unfortunately, Nokia started the patent wars by suing Apple, and then Apple sort of caught that disease and started suing everybody else, and everybody else started suing everybody else. Um, and so we needed some, the, the way patent, patent wars are a disaster because they favor large companies that can bulk up with patents, which include Google, but they, and they uh, disincentivize startups. It's just too, too burdensome for a small company to get the patents necessary. So, so we should change patent law in this country? Well, we said this for years. The, there was an attempt to reform patent law and there was a redo a couple of years ago, but the fact of the matter is there's many, many patents that should not have been given and we, we, Google, spend a great deal of time getting them invalidated. Um, I've argued for a long time that the right thing to do with patents is to open source them. In other words, you basically publish your claimed patent and then you let prior art be shown in a market. Um, everyone thinks this is a brilliant idea except that it's illegal, right? The entire principle of patents is that you don't disclose the information until it's actually given for competitive reasons. So that doesn't work. So going back to Motorola, are you so, all so trying to design so a cool phone, phone No, too? no, hang on, hang on. Yeah. And then, uh, and then so, so half of that, I want to finish the answer the question. There's clearly a patent component, uh, but we've always wanted to be in hardware businesses. And we've always thought that the mobile device, in, in, if you think about what's the, what's the future in the next few years, it's mobile, mobile, mobile. It's mobile first. Mobile this, mobile that, mobile everything else. Mobile local social, right? Those are roughly the keywords that you use now. So we wanted to be a player in that. This next generation of phones, which have not been announced but are being leaked out, um, are phenomenal. Can you show us what the next generation it's Motorola phone will look like? <laughs> Just uh, um, I don't actually have it right on me right now. <laughs> but okay. you've seen it. Yes. Is it cool? It's fantastic. Okay. And you said you liked it, too. I liked it, too. Okay. Why can't we get a QWERTY keyboard on an Android phone? Would you stop? I, I wanted. You wanted to pull out your other phone. I don't have that with me, either. Oh, uh, yeah, but you keep a BlackBerry, too, because you like QWERTY keyboards. I, I like QWERTY keyboards. Um, the, the, what, what's happened in the, what's happened in the, two phones. What's happened in the, mobile in the mobile devices is that uh, the screen takes up so much energy in terms of, f of physical space that they've not been able to come up with a proper screen and a proper keyboard. And I would love one of the Android licenses to do that. Uh, There's nothing preventing them to do that. Uh, what about, um, y'all moved out of search in China. You didn't move out of China in time. Um, do you think China is going to be disadvantaged in the future because they can't allow the free flow of information? You know, as you know, Jared and I spent a year traveling around the world, and it's very dangerous for Americans to go to countries which they're not experts in and then extemporize. The American experience is so uniquely different in terms of the role of government, individual freedom, and so forth. Um, so the average American goes to China says, look, this can't work because you can't build a knowledge economy while you have censorship. And yet when you talk to Chinese people, they'll say, we're doing just fine. Get the hell out of here, right? So my own view is that, that you need the openness that is re represented by a lack of censorship, but it's possible for them to grow pretty well. Uh, I think China is, is going to be in trouble for a relatively simple reason which is the demographics don't work for them. They work right now, and then they become horrific. And when I say horrific, I mean horrific. And furthermore, in a decade, what happens to the hundreds of millions of people who are being displaced into factories for export oriented working, where those factories are replaced by robots? So they've got some very, very serious nation building issues. And I think the correct thing for them to do is to do exactly what I suggested for the rest of us, which is to invest in the knowledge economy. And investing in the knowledge economy means focusing on Encouraging immigration, encouraging entrepreneurship, encouraging the role of women, um, encouraging connectivity, and that, by the way, includes getting rid of censorship. Google and, and Google was sufficiently upset about the censorship that we, because uh, to, to us the censorship is is a statement of fear, not a strategy. So we moved to to Hong Kong. And in ten years, what will be the larger economy, India or China? The, uh, that is debated among economists. Uh, most people think that it will be China with India catching up well. Um, 
for the same reasons that India, um, there's a lot of the thousands of years of history as to why this is, but India has, is a democracy where the government is largely dysfunctional, and China is. I'm sorry, you saw your US or India? That's, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> um, the, 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 it appears as though we've decided as a society to have the federal government do very little, and we seem to be happy with that, mm -hmm. right? So we might as well get our act together at the states and local level and in our companies and by your own act actions to make things better. I don't think the current political structure in America is going to do, there's not very much going on. There's a lot of yelling and screaming, but there's not a lot of activity. Um, whereas in China, you know, you have a functional government, but they, do, they, do, they are fearful of the next rural revolution. They spend a lot of time on this. They've got a lot of structural problems. What would you do to make our government more functional? Um, I would require the, that all districts be redrawn using parallelograms. Yes. <laughs> Those of you who didn't do math remember parallelogram, yeah, that's right? right? Yeah. So um, as, as best I understand, the way we got ourselves here is it's all computer's fault, right? Mm -hmm. um, that was a joke. Well, uh, it is a data mining issue. Is it, it was a data, this is, over the last 20 years, um, both parties engaged in a policy where they would maximize their own safe seats. And so the behavior that you see now, in, especially in the House, makes sense because those draw districts were drawn around specific constituencies. They are acting as they are supposed to, even if you don't like it. And that's true of the liberal districts as well as the conservative districts. And um, one of the sort of secrets is that the Senate is somewhat more moderate than the House is because of this outcome. Uh, and that may be why you see the, Im in the immigration proposal out of the Senate, whereas the House, you have, it's much rougher. What are you doing with uh, uh, President Obama's campaign team, the data team? You've created a new company with them, right? Well, the, the team that I worked with did. Um, a little bit of background on, on what, what the Obama campaign, which I was an advisor to, did. Um, and again, now, now I'm going to switch into politics mode. So, and I'm not, this is not about Google, and I'm not endorsing this. I'm just saying how it works, so we're clear. Uh, the way you win an election is you get more people to vote. Okay, not that complicated. You need, in order to get people to vote, you have get out the vote programs. You have to figure out who to get, the out, get out the vote to. So with modern computers, it's possible to take the voting records and roughly guess, right? Um, the kinds of people and so forth, and then use your resources toward that. The same principle turns out to apply to businesses. And so um, I funded a number of companies out of that campaign because the people, there were interesting teams, uh, and this is me personally, not Google, who are, are capable of finding people that you'd like to talk to. So if you're a business, you want to find these people, you want to market to them. Um, the, give you a classic example. Uh, you're an insurance company and you're subject to the uh, Obamacare. And the way Obamacare works is that these registries get set up and you have to accept all the people coming to you. Well, this is like a financial disaster because the sick people will call you immediately and the health people won't. Right, because the sick people really have to talk to you. And the healthy people say, oh, I'm healthy, I don't need it. So it's much better to go and say, well, let's try to get all the people who need this coverage, including some who are ill and some who are not. Right? That's an example of a positive business example of the same thing. Mm -hmm. uh, in your book, you say that there's no delete button, right. meaning that if you post something as a 12-year-old on Facebook, right. it'll come back at your Senate confirmation hearings or something. <laughs> but there is a delete button that we as individuals don't control, which is the big companies own the servers, and at some point they can rewrite them and do things. Is, is there some way to redress that balance that we have more control over the things than the people who own the servers? Well, I, I think you're asking the question, who gets to decide what information gets to delete? Right. And the, let's talk about the web for a second, and then we'll come back to, to the delete button question. So if somebody writes something um, or re reveals something, it's sitting on a server somewhere. Um, presumably there's the rule of law that applies to that. Mm -hmm. So if someone, for example, makes an illegal copy of a movie and they put it on a server, you can find that copy, you can order them to take it down, sue them, put them in jail, and so forth. That makes sense, okay? 
Well, let's say it's a particularly good copy of a particularly important movie. Well, then someone outside of the United States will make a copy, and then people from the United States will be able to go to it. That doesn't seem fair. That seems like enabling copyright theft, as an example. So on the other hand, how would you decide what to take down? Right? So this is where the rubber meets the road. If, if you call me and you say, we don't like this information up, well, how do I know that you're the legitimate owner of the information? This problem has not been solved. Google solved this problem for YouTube with something called Content ID, where well, if you give us the master, if you're a studio or what have you, we'll match and immediately take it down, because we don't want to be in the business of copyright theft. We've also proposed what are no, generally known as the follow the money rules, where if somebody's profiting on this, uh, this information in another country, that the financial system can go get them, because eventually somebody has to get the information. So those are examples of partial solutions to the problem of how do you identify the person who stole the information, how do you identify who the owner is, and so forth. Um, we're sort of roughly at the right balance, in my, in my view. Um, the example that I use in the book and use with you on stage was the following. Um, you have a teenager. Teenagers, um, as we now know from science, their frontal cortex is not as developed as, as you would like and not as developed as they think. Uh, so teenager makes a mistake or is falsely accused of something. So let's say, for example, they make a mistake and they actually have a juvenile crime. In America, they can, after good works as an adult, they can get that expunged. They can legally answer the question when they apply to your corporation. Have they ever been convicted? They can actually say no. You then do a search on the web. You say, oh, liar, out of here. It doesn't seem right to me. It doesn't seem fair. We have to think about this. And I'm not arguing for censorship. I'm not arguing that I have a solution for that. Now, I've had this debate inside the technical industry and many technical industry people believe, and again, this is not my belief, so we're clear, that there'll be so much publicity about everyone's lives, because everyone's lives are being recorded from birth now, that all of the mistakes that we all make, because nobody here is perfect, I've certainly made mistakes, everybody else here is as well, um, that, that were never recorded, right? Now everything's being recorded, that people will learn to, to, uh, to not apply a zero test to these things that eventually, you know, we saw this with um, President Clinton, President Obama, and the drug use question, right? So imagine 30 years from now, will there be, we have the full record of the presidential candidate, will people actually study it at the level that they study it today? There's a belief among many people that people will, sort of, society will adapt. I don't think we know that. So I'm bringing this up to say we have to have a conversation about it. For things that don't seem fair, we should have a conversation about it and try to figure out how to address it. Create delete buttons. Are there any questions? Yes, right there in the way back. And then, yeah. Yeah. Bill, hey. Thank you. Uh, is this working? Yeah. Uh, Google was one of the great disruptors of advertising from broadcasting and newspapers when you started. And now it seems to be morphing again to a content based set of advertising. Do you? Could you just give us your view of, of how advertising is changing, where you think it's headed? Um, I'm, I'm not sure I agree with the morphing, but let me just explain what we're doing. Um, one, of, one of the sort of great things that Google managed to do was return on investment advertising. And with search ads, it turns out somebody's looking for a product. If they're searching for it, it's a particularly good opportunity to give a targeted ad. And for traditional media, often the ads are very untargeted. So the televisions, for example, when I turn on the TV, it shows me all these ads about products that I could not possibly purchase. You know, there's no baby in the house. I'm not a woman. You know, why are they showing me all these ads? They show me, you know, I'm a man, you know, of an age and so forth and so on. That kind of targeting is now possible on the internet. It was not possible with these uh, other technologies. The same problem has, has been an issue for newspapers and so forth and magazines. Um, we've since invented a content network which attempts to do similar image kinds of things but also do similar targeting. And the targeting is done based on the sort of the things that you're interested in. And you can control that using our dashboard. So, so far the evidence is that customers love this stuff because it gives them a better ROI. And so the return on investment for advertising at Google appears to be the highest of all the choices. So when people do media mix calculations where they decide what to do, what to do, in most cases they give us as much as they can, 
given the limitations of how our systems work, and then they apply to other things. And that seems to be the stable. But situation. do you think Google could or should help journalistic content creation companies? Well, we, we've, in fact, you've asked me this before. We've, I've <laughs> spent a lot of time on this personally with the key, key members from the newspapers. And we do a lot of things. Uh, so for example, if you have a, a newspaper website or a magazine website, we send traffic to your site. We also give you ways of making ads on those sites. We also give you tools to give subscriptions to people. But I think that our friends in such industries have a very hard time because they've lost a couple sources of revenue. The classifieds have largely call, you know, fallen down. Um, the pricing that they can do on these untargeted print ads has fallen down. Um, so it's very difficult for them to, to fill that revenue hole. Um, and it's not obvious to me exactly how you do it. Of course, we could write checks to them, but it wouldn't be for performance or something that was tied to outcomes. We've also had debates inside the company as to whether we should you know, fund curation, fund news, news that way, but we decided that was a line we didn't want to cross. We don't want to compete in that space. We want to build tools to make the revenue hole grow, uh, you know, fill the revenue hole. Yeah, Could you speak to the impact of um, technology on the environment and as devices get quicker and more of the world are using them, what will happen to our natural resources and whether, if that is a problem, whether there is a concerted effort within the industry to address that? Um, there's a series of initiatives around recycling, uh, which I think Apple is an example of a company that's led there, um, and there are many others. Um, the current estimates are that the data centers use about 1.5% of of US electricity production, which is a lot. Um, however, the data centers are much more efficient than the computers that were being used in corporations. So uh, we would argue that it's a net, um, a net savings. Uh, Google has tried hard to be a model of a net zero company, a carbon neutral company, if you will. The buildings we're building are uh, carbon neutral and so forth and so on. Um, I am one of these people who believes that the environmental opportunity is a pro-business opportunity that learning how to build systems that pollute less uh, is actually good for economics, good for entrepreneurship, it produces better products, it, it's just better. Um, we can debate that, but that's my own view. And I think that ultimately, if you think about uh, renewal in America, um, a simple thing the government could do would be to insulate all the old buildings, right? starting with all the federal buildings. There was some money in the ARRA, but there wasn't enough. So overall, I think the role of technology appears to me to be neutral to positive. I don't see technology as being negative. What I do see is that um, the environmental community is figuring out how to, um, to use these tools to get people mobilized. I am struck by the power of incumbency and how hard it is to move incumbents, especially when there's a lot of campaign dollars involved. Mm -hmm. Uh, yeah, right here. I saw that hand next. Sorry. And, and I should say, by the way, that Google starts with the presumption that it f that conversations should start with facts. So it's worth saying that in the climate change conversation. <laughs> so so it's like let's have a conversation. Let's start with facts. Is the Daniel Patrick, Patrick Moynihan quote? Mm -hmm. um, you can have your own opinion, but we can't have your own facts. Yeah. Yes, Bruce Wolf, uh, with the uh, proliferation of. Uh, intrusion into our lives. Uh, I have electronic access to my bank. Um, I'm sure that if somebody really pushed, all my banking information could be obtained very easily. Uh, what is Google doing to allow us to preserve a certain degree of privacy in our own lives, especially in our economic uh, portions? Um, in the book we say, and I'll say again, that if you need to fight for your privacy or you'll lose it. And the reason is that the, that the hawk side of the argument drives fear faster than the principle of the upside of the dove argument. If you think about it for a while, you'll see that's roughly right. Fear drives um, a, a lot of these intrusions. Um, and, and we need to find the right balance in our society. Each country is different. In Google's case, um, we use um, SSL, HTTPS, essentially, for most of the transactions. We use all the industry standard encryption and so forth. And we've recently uh, strengthened much, much of that. So in the case of the bank, um, it would be illegal to do so, but someone could, inside the bank, probably take that information and release it. There is a loophole where if you register as a commercial business, you can get access to the credit reporting bureaus 
and some of these other groups that have these large databases on people. And uh, various people, including myself, have been the victims of people who would just go in there and release all that stuff, which is, again, against the rules. So we, we have to ha come to a shared belief. Uh, one of the questions that, that I keep asking is, given that information once leaked is there forever, this is the Snowden principle, right? He knew what he was doing. He leaked the stuff. And independent of your view of his action, you can't put the information back in. Um, the same thing with WikiLeaks. Um, what should the penalty be for people who leak such information? Well, if it's damaging, it should probably be pretty high because once, once your information is leaked, you've really lost something. Right? You, should have some, you should have some tort or some way of, of recovering at least some justice as a victim of such a crime. Would it be technologically feasible and socially useful for us to be able to opt into an internet that had secure ID and you knew exactly who you were dealing with? Welcome to China. <laughs> Welcome to China. Um, I'm in the Beijing airport having come from North Korea, right? <laughs> the bastion of internet freedom, China. That was a joke. <laughs> and I'm sitting in the airport. I'm trying to get a Wi-Fi signal, and it won't connect me because I don't have a secure ID. And they had just passed a law in China that you could not use a Wi-Fi connection without a registered unique ID, which would tell the police who you were. I just. I just don't think we want to go down that path. There's just a lot of issues yeah. when you start doing that. All right. Um, I'm sorry. Let me. Okay. You're walking up there. There. Yeah. Looking for. Yeah. Uh, my name is Alan Heddleson. Um, Einstein once said that he didn't like to memorize a lot of things. He liked to be able to know where to find the information. And Google has made us almost Einstein-like in that we're all much smarter because we can go to Google and ask questions. But conversely, do you think there's a point in the evolution where we're so dependent on this technology? And I think most of us in this room who have embraced the technology but have the basic intelligence as opposed to young people today who are so dependent on the technology, and if their phone is dead, they're sort of non-functional. Yep, all right. And now we, we get you, the point. Let me let Eric answer. How do you see it. that evolving? Well, we like the fact that people use our phones. <laughs> more, more phone usage is good. Please turn your phones on and use them while I'm talking. That's right. Uh, Further, uh, so, so but a more serious answer is that a, a lot of people have decried youth. Uh, when I was a young man, they decried rock, rock, rock and roll. They were going to destroy us, mm -hmm. um, and somehow we grew up okay. Uh, there's no one really knows what the long-term negative impacts are of constant connectivity of young people, but some of the theories that in the past are clearly wrong. The whole theory of bowling alone is clearly false. Yeah. Um, the evidence is that the average teenager sends something like you know 100 texts a day. The, the, the numbers that are being quoted are astounding. These are highly, highly social animals that we are reproducing, and that's good. Um, a lot I'm, better than watching television well, passively. You know, think about it. Much more engaged. Um, if you have a child and your child is awake, they are online. <laughs> if they wake up in the middle of the night, they're online. This is not a bad thing. <laughs> we'll make this the last one. So you talk and I live in Aspen. I I'm sorry. Speak up. Yes, yes. Can you hear me? Yep. I'm Martha Woodfell. I live in Aspen. I invested in Angel Fund 2 mm -hmm. with two young kids named Sergey and Larry okay. who invented Google. Mm. And I want to thank you. Thank you. <laughs> I wouldn't be living in Aspen if I hadn't done that. Well, we're, ha <laughs> we're, we're, happy to have made your <laughs> we're happy to have made your life better. All right, let me, uh, last question in the way back. Thank okay, you. yes, sir. My name is uh, Todd Martin, and I live in Aspen and Dallas. Uh, my question goes to the knowledge economy that we've become. What about the adults that are less than college educated today? Is there, a, is there a technology direction that could accelerate their becoming more competitive, more value generative, you know, and address some of the decades of uh, dealing with that issue? And since this is the last question, let me broaden it slightly which is, can technology, instead of widening the gap in our society, 
between right. the fortunate and less fortunate, so, shrink that gap? So, so it's a very good question. Uh, the, the economic answer is there's a debate in the economics community over the answer to those questions. I'll give you my own bias. Um, it's easy to imagine people who are not college educated as being generic. You know, they're all the same and so forth, but that's not really true. And one of the things that's true about these new systems, and especially over the next decade, is it'll be possible for whatever you're particularly good at to be expressed very strongly. There are example after example of the world's best lawyer it turns out to be this 17-year-old you know, girl who was operating out of her home, which didn't realize it was illegal to be a lawyer. Uh, you know, there are gifted people among the group that you're describing. So let's assume that the gifted people and the self-motivated people who did not go to college, let's take them out. Let's assume that they're taken care of. What do you do with a person who's got a bad attitude, not motivated, doesn't really want to work, has other problems, medical problems, what have you, all, the sum of all of that. Um, and there's not agreement on what happens with those people. Um, if you look at the way Germany does it, they have a program where they identify at the age of 13 or 14 people to go into essentially high-tech high vocational schools. And those high-tech vocational schools produce people who are not college educated by our terms, who end up with very important, very high-paid jobs. And there's been a discussion in America about revitalizing the uh, community college system in America to try to sort of do a little bit of that. That may be a possible. I think the core question is you have these huge disruptions which are going on right now um, from the older economy to the knowledge economy. What do you do with the middle-aged person who doesn't have the skills and doesn't want to learn? Right? And so I think that ultimately the, the dislocations are sort of very severe and very real. I'm not in any way suggesting they're easy. It's ultimately the American answer ultimately is about an individual, right? So what I tell people is, do you have a computer? Inevitably they do. Have you used it? Yes. Have you, can you use Google, right? What are you curious about? Everyone's curious and get started that way. Uh, the question of inequality is actually, uh, again, in the, in the Panglossian view of technology from a decade ago, the belief was that technology would level everybody out. But there's evidence that the inverse is true, that because of globalization, a set of winners are emerging that have much greater power than perhaps they should, much greater wealth, much greater reach, and so forth. Google is an obvious winner example, because it's a global firm rather than a firm that's limited just to Colorado, right, or California, or the United States. So one of the, que the public policy questions is that given that the knowledge economy produces people with extremely high uh, winning outcomes, if you will, what do you want to do? The traditional answer for that is progressive taxation, right? That in fact these people pay lots of taxes and then that translates. But I think the core problem in America is that you're going to end up with s a smaller number of people working, supporting a large number of people, larger number of people, because of the simple math of demographics. Because as the middle age, as the baby boomers age, you get a lot of older people who need to be supported through social security and so forth. And you have this young cohort, which is busy texting all night apparently, that is gonna sort of be paying for us. So I think we need to focus on that group and make sure that they have every opportunity that we've had, right? And by the way, the ones I work with at Google are fantastic, right? It's much smarter, much better in every, every de demand than I was, than the people that I was with, with college. So let's figure out a way to make them empowered so we can have a nice, comfy retirement. <laughs> At the Aspen Institute, Thank we you. believe in leadership based on values. Thank you. Eric Thank you. Smith is an example Thank of leadership based on values. Thank you. Perfect. Thanks.